engineers who start companies often find themselves building something that they have no experience building, a hiring process. Hiring engineers today is not as systematic as building software. We don't have lots of data that tells us what makes for an effective programming interview question. The smartest tech companies in the world are still making hiring mistakes, often through the false negative of rejecting candidates who did not do well in their interview process, or through the false positive of hiring candidates who did well in the interview but were not a good fit for the job. If you are a hiring manager or a company founder, you will eventually have to build a hiring process. If you don't treat that hiring process scientifically, you will likely make some mistakes. Amin Bartram has conducted more than 1,000 interviews with engineers, accumulating a vast amount of data. This data was gathered deliberately and scientifically. Through closely tracked interview questions and a consistent end-to-end process for the job candidate, Amon joins the show to talk about the data set that he has accumulated, the conclusions from all of these interviews, and how engineering organizations can use this data to develop a smart, data-driven hiring process. Amon is co-founder of TripleByte, a company that helps match engineers and tech companies. TripleByte also publishes lots of research and blog articles about conducting good interviews, developer salary statistics, and boot camps versus computer science degrees. Full disclosure, TripleByte is a sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. However, Amon has been a guest several times before on the show, since before TripleByte was a sponsor, and I always enjoy getting to talk to him. It's icing on the cake that TripleByte has become a sponsor of Software Engineering Daily because I think the product is really cool, and it's something that I would use if I was looking for a job right now as a software engineer. Kubernetes can be difficult. Container networking, storage, disaster recovery... These are issues that you would rather not have to figure out alone. Mesosphere's Kubernetes as a Service provides single-click Kubernetes deployment with simple management, security features, and high availability to make your Kubernetes deployments easy. You can find out more about Mesosphere's Kubernetes as a Service by going to softwareengineeringdaily.com slash mesosphere. Mesosphere's Kubernetes as a Service heals itself when it detects a problem with the state of the cluster. So you don't have to worry about your cluster going down, and they make it easy to install monitoring and logging and other tooling alongside your Kubernetes cluster. With one-click install, there's additional tooling like Prometheus, Linkerd, Jenkins, and any of the services in the service catalog. Mesosphere is built to make multi-cloud, hybrid cloud, and edge computing easier. To find out how Mesosphere's Kubernetes as a Service can help you easily deploy Kubernetes, you can check out softwareengineeringdaily.com slash mesosphere, and it would support Software Engineering Daily as well. One reason I am a big fan of Mesosphere is that one of the founders, Ben Hindman, is one of the first people I interviewed about software engineering back when I was a host on Software Engineering Radio, and he was so good and so generous with his explanations of various distributed systems concepts, and this was back four or five years ago when some of the applied distributed systems material was a little more scant in the marketplace. It was harder to find information about distributed systems uh, in production, and he was one of the people that was evangelizing it and talking about it and obviously building it in, in Apache Mesos. So I'm really happy to have Mesosphere as a sponsor, and if you want to check out Mesosphere and support Software Engineering Daily, go to softwareengineeringdaily.com slash mesosphere. Amon Bartram, you are a co-founder at TripleByte. Welcome back to Software Engineering Daily. Thank you. It's uh, good to be here. You've done over 1,000 interviews with engineers. How confident are you in your ability to assess an engineer in the limited time frame of an interview at this point? I am confident that I'm getting some real signal. I'm confident that I've improved since since we began TripleByte and that sort of the lessons we've learned help sort of our team and me 
do a better job, but there still is fundamentally a lot of noise in the process. So I, I think it's important to kind of view it through a statistical lens, right? So someone interviews and, and they do poorly or they do well, what that means is, okay, post this interview, there's a higher probability that this person is, you know, this person could do the job well, or a, a lower probability this person could do the job well. Um, I, you know, it, I still very much feel like it's a probabilistic statement, and, I, and, and you know, it certainly could be wrong in any one case. Across 1,000 interviews and then many more that, that you did not conduct within the company, you get a pretty detailed data set, and it's a unique data set. What kinds of unique data do you feel that you've accumulated from all of these hours of interviews? Me personally, <laughs> how, how do I answer that personally? But, but so the, the company as a whole, um, the really exciting thing that we can do is just keep track of what questions we're asking and then go back after the fact and figure out, okay, you know, across, you know, all of these thousands of candidates, which questions and which sort of impressions of the interviewer are most correlated with candidates doing well at companies. And we can use that to get better over time. And I guess to answer some of the fundamental, you know, there's, there's a huge amount of debate among, among even experienced interviewers about what sort of skills matter, or what, what are important questions to ask. And, you know, this data set means that we can actually get some empirical answers to some of those questions. So you can find out questions that if you ask them, they have a high correlation of the candidates doing well. Is that what you said? Yeah. So the main thing we do is we interview candidates. Then we help them get jobs at companies. And so we're able to see the extent to which individual questions we ask, you know, either, either correlate or, or do not correlate with candidates going on to, you know, receive job offers or, or you know, take a job and enjoy that job um, at a company. And so I guess there are questions that people could ask, like, are manhole covers or why are manhole covers round? Or, you know, if you drop an egg from a floor of, a, of an end story building, how high can you get in the building without the egg breaking? These kinds of questions. Yeah, I think that was the, the, the minimal number of eggs it takes to determine the floor on a building <laughs> where the, the, the highest one bunker you can drop the egg and the egg won't break. Right. So you can, from your data, you can detect that these kinds of questions perhaps are low signal and maybe a question like find all the anagrams in a set of words. Maybe that's a higher signal question. And you have described the major challenge in the interview process as inconsistency. So the interview questions can vary across interviews. The interviewers might be having a bad day. The interviewee might be nervous on a particular day. When you look at the interviewing process across the entire industry, what are the inconsistencies that you think cause the most trouble? Well, first of all, if you attempt to measure how consistent interview results are, you know, almost everyone who does this is a little bit terrified by, by what they see. Google head of people wrote a book about this, Laszlo, Laszlo Bach. We have some research on this. And, you know, it's, interviews are meaningful. They are important. We don't currently have an alternative. We keep doing them. And yet, the actual signal that each individual interview delivers is quite a bit less than we would like to believe. And all of those things you mentioned can, can contribute to noise. Um, I think one of the biggest factors is the fact, uh, is basically what the interviewer thinks is important. So, you know, each interviewer has, you know, some area, areas where, where they themselves are likely strong and they, they, they understand, they can deeply feel why it's important to know those things. And yet each interviewer also has areas where they're not strong. Things that if you ask them good questions in those areas, they, they, would, they would look less intelligent, let's say. And of course, every interviewer is going to ask about areas where they're strong. Um, and that ends up introducing a lot of noise, um, especially if the company hasn't been careful and rigorous about specifying up front what skills matter for the job. So, you know, if the company decides that it's super important that, you know, everyone we hire be strong in algorithms, then it's totally, you know, that, that's, let's ignore for now whether that's the right or the wrong decision. Let's say it's the right decision for that company. You know, then it's totally appropriate for interviewers to come in and, you know, push candidates hard on details of a particular algorithmic question. But if a company has, you know, has not specified whether algorithms are important, then you have a stage where half the interviewers are doing that and the other half are, you know, going down hard onto API design. Which interview you speak to is going to have a huge impact on, on how well you do. Um, because many of the best candidates who are strong in algorithms are going to you know, do much less well on, on an API design question and, and vice versa. What you said there about there not being a known alternative to the current interview process. And now, I've always been a fan of the contract to hire model or the trial period model. 
you and I have talked about this a little bit in the past, but I saw in this talk that you gave that many engineers are actually averse to doing that. Engineers do not want to do this. They would rather go through the interview process for all of the lumps that the interview process has. Good engineers often prefer the interview process to a trial period or a contract to hire period, even though they would get paid in a contract to hire period. You know, you get you come on to a company in a part time capacity for, let's say, two weeks, you get paid, you get to figure out if you like working at the company, the company gets to figure out if they like you. It seems very win win. Why don't candidates like that? Yeah, first of all, I'm actually very much a fan of that model. Um, when it can, like, if both parties are okay with that, it is almost certainly a more fair, more accurate way to judge whether someone's a good, a good fit for your company and then let them judge whether, whether, whether you're a good fit for them. The problem, as you said, is that a large portion of engineers, well, there's two problems. Uh, the first problem, actually, is that the cost to the company of running you know, a trial period is so high that you, you, there's no way that you can really afford to do a trial period for every applicant, everyone, everyone who could possibly apply to your company. And so it kind of this is kind of just kicking the problem that you know can down the road, right? So if we're if we're going to use a contract to hire as part of our process, that's it's a very expensive step. We we still have to have to gatekeep that somehow. We have to decide which of all the resumes we see goes through to contract to hire, and that gets you back in the same messy area of you know trying to evaluate resumes and trying to conduct interviews to determine who goes forward to the contact to hire. That's the first problem. The second problem is that. So we did some survey, a survey on this across our candidates. We actually ran a version of our interview, which was, which was a take-home project, a very long take-home project, so some similarities to a trial period. And what we found is that only about 20% of the engineers on our platform are interested in going that route. Um, 80%, you know, for all of the, of the negativity which you hear about, interview, about interviews, 80% preferred just the higher stress, but, you know, one and done, what, you know, approach. And I think if you think about uh, sort of your friends working in the industry, it actually makes more sense, right? Uh, many people are in the position of currently holding a job. They're working somewhere and they like to find a new, a, a new job. Juggling, figuring out how to take a week off and spend a week working at a different company is a pretty huge commitment. I um, mean, especially if you want to sort of toe dip a little bit and see what it's like at like four or five different companies. So there's absolutely no way that if you're currently working full time at, at one company that you're going to be able to go through you know, four or five trial periods at four or five companies to, to just, you know, to find the place that's best for you. And so many people prefer the approach, even though it's a bit higher stress of going in, doing those four or five interviews, and then being able to, you know, have all the offers on the table and make a decision about, about where they want to work. When you're talking about the traditional interview process, at this point, how many hours does it take with an average candidate to have a strong signal for how good of an engineer they are. Can you typically, you know, kick out a lot of people in the first interview part of the funnel? Or do you really need multiple hours to have a strong signal for whether or not they're a worthwhile candidate? So the more you have measured and tuned your process, the more signal you can get quickly. So the, the trial by interview that candidates do, so candidates going through our, our process on our platform do a two-hour interview with us. For folks who, who were hiring to join our core team, we then do an additional four-hour interview after that. So it's a total of six hours people were hiring. I think that that's, that's actually fairly standard for the industry. I think we're maybe slightly on the long side. However, I think the most interesting way to answer this question is to look at sort of the optimization we've done on our two-hour interview. And the cool thing we've done there, basically have, you know, as our interviewers are conducting the interview, we have them at, you know, five-minute increments through each, throughout each problem basically assign a sort of quick on-the-spot grade. So basically, you know, if I were grading this problem right now, what grade would I give? And what that lets us do then, it basically, as we ask a problem, we can go in and look over, you know, over thousands of candidates. Okay, at what point, you know, this, this problem currently is an hour long. There's just an hour working on it. You know, at what point in that problem does the interviewer grading basically lock into the final grade? And what we found there is if we put a lot of work into standardizing and training interviewers, we are able to compress a lot of the standard interview sections down to a shorter version and still get you know almost all the signal. Um, so for example, we tend to do 30-minute coding sections. We actually started out with a 90-minute coding section. This was a big part of our interview. We, we kind of believed that, that a larger practical section was, was likely to be more predictive, and we found that it was. And then over the last three years, by measuring at which point in that process we actually learned the signal, we've been able to compress that down to 30 minutes and, and then free up the other time in the interview to add other, other sections and, and get more signal. But I do want to add a little bit of a warning there. So, so done well, backed up by data, it's possible to compress longer sections down and, and get a signal in 30 minutes on a, on a certain you know, aspect of the candidate. 
But one of the problematic ways that bias can seep into interviews is this tendency of people to make snap judgments, to get into a room and just say, this person gives me a perception of, of someone who's a good programmer, or this person gives me a perception of someone who's a bad programmer. And I think it's really important to be consciously aware of that and to try to fight back and avoid coming in with any kind of preconception. So I would, if I was designing an interview team you know, from scratch and I didn't have access to a large data set, I would definitely want to start with longer sessions, not shorter sessions. You are producing a steady stream of content around the interviewing process where you're essentially reporting on these large-scale studies that you're doing as you're interviewing lots of candidates for TripleByte. And some of the stuff that you're producing is, is really helpful because it's you give a good framework for how tech companies can design their own interview process. And I think there's a, there's a surprising scarcity of well-reasoned material around how to construct an interview process. And it makes sense that each company should have its own interview process because different companies are hiring different kinds of engineers. You know, you and I did a, a show about cultural fit and you know, I think cultural fit is one of these things that pervades an organization. It's like cultural fit is your fingerprint identity of your organization, and that's going to affect how your organization does engineering. Like, do they all go out to lunch together? How much pair programming do they do? And ideally, that kind of stuff should seep into the interview process as well, because if you if you have an organization that's heavily rooted in pair programming and there's no indication of that pair programming in the interview process, you're going to get some candidates through the door that are going to do really well in the interview process. And they're going to be like, I don't want to do any pair programming. I want to sit in front of my computer and code by myself all day. And so this idea of crafting your own interview process, not copying Google's or Facebook's or Microsoft's or, you know, any other companies but really defining your own interview process. I think this is really important. And so you've, you've spent a lot of time talking about this. So the interview process can really vary on what the company wants the potential hire to do. Obviously, it also depends on the culture, as I just said. But you and I have talked about this before, where some companies will ask you to code a really hard problem around directed acyclic graphs, for example, like something like the, the you know, Dijkstra's algorithm or some complicated algorithm like that, when they're actually just looking for candidates to maintain their Ruby on Rails application, for example. It has nothing to do with directed acyclic graphs. How should a company decide what questions to actually ask their candidates? How can they find questions that map closely to the kinds of work they're actually hiring people for? So yeah, I think there's a, a few different big topics there. Let me let me back up and I'll talk about the, the uh, deciding questions uh, second about sort of customizing the interview content for the culture. Yeah, that's, that's definitely true. It's especially true from a you know the example you gave from, from a, you know providing the candidate a sense of what it's going to be like to work in your company, right? Part like and, and and you know this, 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 it's okay to have a sales aspect to this. Your goal is to sort of sell yourself for your best foot forward, but it's also important, of course, that candidates who are just not going to be happy and not going to fit in that they're able to, you know, learn that themselves and, and self-select out. Because you, of course, don't want to hire someone who absolutely hates pair programming and is going to, or absolutely going to hate your code review process or, or, or whatever. But I actually think, so that, that's true, definitely true. But I don't think that that's one of the major problems affecting interview design. And maybe I'm a little bit biased by, but it's funny. Like, when you, when you do a thing at large scale, you can just sort of, it all can, can all blend together. But I speak to so many companies about, about their hiring process and about their engineering process, and they're not that different. <laughs> I hate to say it, but the majority of companies, perhaps there are a few buckets, but I think most companies running relatively similar interview processes, if those processes were well-designed and well-thought-out, would be an improvement to, to what we have right now. Um, so I don't think that reflecting your specific culture should be a guiding principle when designing an interview. The second part of your question was sort of how to decide whether algorithms are an important sort of topic for your company. That's right. Yeah. So unfortunately, I don't have a great answer here because we have... If you look at different companies, different very successful companies, you can find examples of, you know, Google, for example, famously, has made computer science and computer science understanding um, an important, you know, part of what they look for. And they, they do that in spite of the fact that, they're, they, they, that they hire people for roles where that doesn't, you know, that they hire front-end developers to work on product, and they want those folks to be strong in computer science. And if you ask them why, they say that they think it shows it's some measure of rigor, 
Uh, they say that you know creating super high quality, well designed you know front end code is very important. And they say that they like the fact that they have a single bar for LLFCS knowledge means that folks can more easily transfer from front end teams to to other teams. And if that makes perfect sense, and you also have you know a company like Facebook, which has you know famously taken a, a sort of more practical approach. And Facebook you know tends to be more willing to hire someone who is a very strong front-end hacker and may have zero knowledge of, of, you know, of Dijkstra's or perhaps even you know, the, the concept of complexity analysis. And you know, obviously, both Facebook and Google are, are you know, immensely successful. And so I'm loath to give very specific advice because there are so many examples of companies that are successful taking different approaches. Uh, I've personally taken an approach more skewed toward the practical skills. Um, I, I think it's... And I'll, I always feel terrible if I reject someone for a job when they could have done the underlying work. So, so like, I'm loath to look for a skill, let's say, you know, knowledge of, of, of algorithms or, or self-balancing, you know, binary search trees um, that isn't sort of in use in the role. And would you pass judgment on Google there? Is there any chance do you think Google has succeeded in spite of the fact that they are uh, screening people who are just good front-end hackers rather than succeeding because they are screening out front those front-end hackers? Yes, there's definitely a chance of that. There's definitely a chance of that. The flip side is, you mentioned Dijkstra's as an example of a really hard algorithm. As someone who likes computer science like algorithms, you know, that does ruffle my feathers slightly just because I can, you know, Dijkstra's isn't actually terribly complicated and it's a pretty interesting idea that, that I do think it's useful to, uh, to know about, right? So part of me does agree with sort of the observation that if you, so if you're a small startup and you're struggling for people to apply, you're absolutely being a fool. You shouldn't have your foot if you reject people who can't do your, your, ta- your work because they don't know Dijkstra's algorithm. But if you're Google and you, ha- you, you, know, you have access to uh, you know, an extremely ample stream of talent, I do think people who have t- undertaken the effort to, to master the theoretical underpinnings of computer science, on balance, not all of them, but on balance, probably do bring some important rigor and perspective to, uh, to the company. I'm not w- necessarily willing to criticize a company that, that has access to uh, enough applicants for uh, screening on those axes. Interview Camp is a four-week online boot camp that teaches you techniques for making it through the interview process. If you're trying to land a job at Google, Facebook, or other tech companies, you know that the interview process can be so stressful. Why do I have to learn how to balance a binary tree? Who cares how many of these words are anagrams of each other? Why does it matter that I know how a hash map works? Unfortunately, the bizarre hiring process of tech companies is here to stay, whether it makes sense or not. So it's time to learn to play the interview game. Interview Camp takes the stress out of interview preparation. Interview Camp is a four-week online boot camp that teaches you techniques, not just problems. Their course material is online. They have more than 15 hours of video and more than a hundred techniques and curated questions. You have access to the material for a full year, so you can go at your own pace that suits you. Interview Camp has weekly live sessions with their students. They answer your questions, they discuss system design and algorithm topics in detail. It's like having a set of peers who are in the same situation discussing topics that you've always had questions about. Interview Camp is available at interviewcamp.io slash p slash se daily. There you can get help with the interview process and support software engineering daily. Again, that's interviewcamp.io slash p slash se daily. You might have questions like, which company should you apply to? How do you negotiate the best salary offer? Which database should you use for a system design problem? Go to interviewcamp.io slash p slash se daily and get help with the interview process. Thank you to Interview Camp for being a new sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. You emphasize that companies should use a structured interview format, and this is in contrast to a free form, intuitive conversational interview. And I've had some of these free form intuitive conversational interviews over the phone 
with some people. And, and some people bake it into an interview process where there is a structured interview as part of the interview pipeline, but maybe there's an early conversation where it's, or a late conversation where you just chat with somebody sort of, you know, can you have a half technical, half conversational conversation, but you really emphasize the importance of the structured interview, the come into a room, you know, you're asked a technical question or two or three, and you have to answer these and you have to write out code to solve them. Why do you lean on the idea of structured interviews so much? Yeah, that's one of the results that's pretty clear from sort of the research in this area, the sort of research into how to reduce bias in interviews. And that's that structure helps. So this is, this is a, it's, it's a very funny, it's very counterintuitive. So if you ask a, you know, a room full of really experienced, you know, excellent engineers who have you know, done many, many interviews about what kind of interview they believe to be most predictive, they will almost all tell you that a free-form interview where they, where they get to sort of ask questions and follow their intuition and, and you know, respond to what the candidate says with, with relevant follow-ups, they will almost all say that that you know, is the most accurate way. And if you ask to a room full of candidates, you know, what type of interview do you prefer? They will almost always also say, "Oh, we, I, I think a structured interview is a you know so I, sorry, I think I think a free form interview is a better way for me to show my skills." But if you look at the actual data on this, and this this is true across this is true in our data set, uh, this is true across I think nearly every study in engineering and other areas. Um, a structured interview is simply a better predictor of, of how employees do on the job, and it's, it's more accurate, and it's also better at getting over some of the bias that can plague this, some of the sort of preconception people bring in where they judge based on what someone looks like or, 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 the, or the, you know, their gender or their race rather than on the skills they see in front of them. So perhaps the intuitive freeform interview feels better, but if we're really talking about a practical interview process that leads to success in the job, structured interviews are better. Yes, absolutely. So I, yeah, actually, I'd like to go a little bit more into that. So in the best case scenario, structured means you know, that you've done hundreds of interviews for this role and you've standardized all the questions and everything's being asked exactly the same. And, you know, if, if you're working in a company that's big enough that you can do that, that's awesome. We do that here. I highly recommend it. But if you're smaller and, you know, you're interviewing just the first few people for a role, you obviously don't have the, you know, the data set. You don't have a way to put together this sort of, you know, massive standardized process. But, but there's an important part of structuring an interview which you still can do. And that is the part where you decide what you're measuring. So basically, rather than going into a, a room with a candidate and saying, my goal is to determine, is this person globally a good candidate for my company? If you, rather than doing that, if you make, you make a list and you say, okay, we want people who are very productive, we want people who are strong in back-end architecture, and we want people with you know, good communication and soft skills. So you say, okay, let's do, let's do three interview sessions, one focus on each of those, those areas, line up your interviewers, and just tell each of them, your goal is to go into this room, you know, interview this person, and assess their architecture skill. You know, your goal is to go in this room, you know, interview the person and assess their, 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 their productivity. Do those interviews, get the scores back, and make a decision based on those scores. Uh, the, you know, the research shows that that ends up being quite a bit less biased. So when interviewers are tasked with making a single global decision, so, so interview someone and decide if you think this is the person a good person to hire, their biases creep through much more strongly than if they go in with a targeted attribute they're trying to evaluate. So going in to, you know, to judge if this person is productive. And so, interestingly, even without standardizing the interview content, simply by being structured about what it is you're trying to assess, and then making a decision based on those assessments, you end up with a less biased process. You're personally focused on the interviewing process, and you are, as I've said, you've, you've written a lot about how companies should construct their own interview process. And so, if a company has decided that they are going to do a structured interview, they're not going to do this free-form intuitive interview... They know what they want to focus on. Maybe they're going to maintain their Rails application. And now they need to define what specific questions they're going to ask somebody. How does a company decide what specific questions to ask? Is there some repository of questions they can choose from? Should they find questions that map closely to internal problems that they're having? How do they define what questions to ask? You'll notice that when I, when I write about this, I often leave this... You know, I talk about this after the other things, and that's, that's intentional. Um, I think this is actually a less important question. I think once you know what access you care about, once you have sort of a structure there, questions aren't quite as important. You know, some key things here, first of all, is that, you know, there is an issue if, if the candidates know the questions in advance. So if you, if you use, you know, questions from, from the internet or questions from, from, from a repository, that may introduce some noise. So I just recommend sitting down with your engineering team, your interview team, 
and brainstorming. You know, it's kind of like, it's, it's, it's sort of an editorial process, kind of like, like writing a blog post, you know, throw out ideas, you know, workshop them, tweak them. You know, the end goal is to ask every candidate the same questions. So you need, you know, if, if you spend a week doing this, you know, you can come up with 20, 30 questions fairly easily, you know, from those pick, you know, the top 10 and, and just go with those. There, there are some principles I can recommend sort of when evaluating though, that list, deciding which ones are sort of best. Real fun that I like is the idea that you want to avoid questions that where, you, where, where there's some danger that the question might have been given away to the candidate. So, you know, if, if you imagine that, let's say this, this candidate's friend did the interview last week and they had a, a two minute Skype call, what could the friend have told the candidate would have given them a hugely unfair advantage? Um, or or what, what, what could they have read in a glass door, you know, review of your because that's going to happen. <laughs> that would have given them an unfair advantage. And some questions, so for example, you, you earlier today, you asked, you, you, you gave me examples of, of some questions. There's like the manhole, the manhole question, for example, manhole cover question, right? The answer to that question takes 15 seconds to articulate. And so if someone's friend tells them the answer to that question, they're just going to know it and you're going to get zero signal from it. You know, compare that to a question where it's you know, something more like, here's the game Connect 4, please go implement it. And maybe here's, you know, add this feature to it, right? So that, that question, you know, that is a new question. It's a, it's a, the answer is this, you know, process. It's going to, you know, unroll over 30 minutes or, you know, or, or 90 minutes and involve hundreds of little small micro steps and, and, and decisions made by the candidate. And so, yeah, obviously, if they were told in advance that, that, that to expect that, they'll be able to prepare a little bit. But there's no way that the, like, the essence of the question can be given away. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Those are just like trick questions, basically, and it's not worth. They're not necessarily trick questions, right? So there could be there could be a totally reasonable question that is going to give you some signal on whether someone is, is skilled or not. But if it has this sort of leap of insight quality and it can be given away, what that means is it's going to be more noisy. So there will still be some signal there. I mean, I mean, to be to be totally frank, even the mental question is going to have some. If, if you if you ask that question to you know a thousand people and study the you know did some statistical analysis of the results, answering it correctly would be a positive indicator of, of ability to, to do probably almost any job, actually. <laughs> True. But, but the key thing is that questions that have a single leap of insight have, a much, have much more noise because under the, the harsh lights of the interview, you know, the person's very stressed. They, they, they may well spin their wheels and just not get that leap of insight or their friend may have told them in advance, in which case, you know, they have this huge advantage. You don't necessarily know that as an interviewer. And so you can't distinguish them from, a, you know, from an awesomely brilliant person. In a previous episode, you and I talked about this idea of hiring for strengths and not lack of weakness. And this is a subtle point. It's one that I think a lot of people miss. And it's easy to miss because, you know, there are people who have gaping strengths, but they have really strong or ga- gaping weaknesses, but they have really strong strengths. They have kind of a barbell uh, quality to them. And, you know, some people might think that that means that you shouldn't hire them because they're not well balanced. But actually, in many kind of work environments, you don't need somebody to be decent at everything. You just need them to be really good at one specific thing. But if you think about that, you know, a lot of interview questions are gauging a more general breadth of skills. So should the interview process try to tailor the questions to a candidate's specific strengths? So I think no. Totally agree with you. I think it's a really important point. But I actually, th- I think, so, so the danger of trying to tailor the questions is that can get you, that can pull you out of the structured interview and into, a, in, into the interview where the interviewer, the interviewer is just guiding, guiding and sort of as they see fit. And that ends up bringing other noise back in. So I think my favorite way to approach this problem is to give in mind, so you realize, you know, give your hiring managers, your, your people making the decisions that, that you know, it really is okay to accept to, to hire someone who's weak in an area if they're very strong in other areas that you care about. Um, so that, that's one point. But the second one is that this, this step of deciding what skills matter for your company and then designing structure around that ends up going a long way to solving the problem, right? Because if you decide that this, it really is vital that all candidates you hire be strong in this area, then you do want to fail someone who's weak in that area even if they have other strengths, right? That's part of making that decision. And a key point here is that it's okay to, to, to sort of have more than one, let me use the term archetype of engineer you're hiring. So for example, you might decide that, you know, we want to hire engineers who are either, you know, super mathy and, you know, they, they can go work on our you know, machine learning, you know, models and do this really hard mathy stuff. And we also want to hire people who are super productive, you know, product hackers. We don't care at all if they, if they, if they know any math. And maybe you have one interview process, you know, but... You have, when you're actually, so, so in, that, in that case, you would ask, you, 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 the, the process would be, would be structured. So every candidate would be asked a section where was, that was evaluating, you know, math and hard analytical stuff. And every candidate would have a session look, looking at, you know, product sense and productivity. 
But then when it comes time to make the decision, you would accept people who were strong in one of those areas, even if they showed complete massive weakness in the other. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I agree with that. Now, the overall experience of interviewing and of hiring people is a funnel. So it begins with the process of somebody seeing an ad or somebody getting reached out to, somebody seeing a LinkedIn post or something like that, and and then they come in for their interviews. You've been focused most on this process, the interview process, and then at the end of it, there's the closing process where if the candidate gets approved, then you know you have a negotiation around salary and uh, whether or not the person wants to work there. As a company is crafting the overall funnel, the overall hiring funnel, what are the other subjective things that they should be considering along these other axes, like you know the amount of ads to run or how to bring in people to the top of funnel and and how to run that closing process? Yeah, well, they, they should obviously just all use Trillbyte, and then their, their problems will all be solved. No. Uh, <laughs> so we, we can't help with all of those steps, but in, terms of in, a, in a broader design... So, so I, I focus mostly on, on the evaluation, so that's, that's, that's kind of my, my lens, but that does end up impacting all of this. So, for example, it is important to keep in mind when designing the interview process that, you know, if you like someone after, after the interview, you have to close them. Right? You, you can't, you know, they're, not, they're not yours yet. <laughs> you have to convince them to join your company. And if your interview was terribly negative and they, they, they were fighting with the interviewers, you know, they're not going to accept the offer. And so, you know, this is sort of focusing on some, some of the just communication soft skills on the part of the interviewers. So, you know, are your interviewers providing a generally positive experience for the candidates? You know, for example, I think, you know, the skills required to, to, to be an engineer, like really knowing your stuff, um, that, that's not enough to be a good interviewer. You, you know, you, you need to have those skills. And then you also need to be probably in the top 50% of all, of all employees of that company on just sort of empathy, communication, ability to sort of connect with someone. And, you know, that can go a long way. And I think it's also great to actually mix some, some honestly, some, some sort of almost sales sessions into the interview. So maybe midway through the interview, you have a session where it's, you know, 30 minutes of the candidate meeting with, a, with a, you know, an engineer talking about things the company is working on currently and maybe unreleased features and get, you know, demoing that to the candidate and like showing them, the, you, know, you know, behind the scenes, your, you know, your, your stats dashboard, things like that, where it's, it's not about evaluation at all. That's purely about bonding with the candidate and, you know, setting it up so that if you make them an offer that they'll be inclined to take it. Right. This is another macro suggestion that you give the idea of focusing on the overall candidate experience throughout the whole process. So you want to be empathetic about how a candidate is experiencing the interview process. And this can include really subtle things like, you know, do you offer them some sparkling water as they come in the door? And do you put them in a nice little air conditioned room and, and so on? What are some other principles around keeping the candidate experience high and making sure that people don't feel uncomfortable? A big one is dealing with, with candidates, dealing with candidates doing poorly on questions or whole sections of the interview. So again, in, in line with this idea that, that you're going to be hiring for strengths, you're going to expect that pe- people who you want to hire are going to have individual sessions where they do poorly. And the individual interviewer who's just doing that section might not know that this person like absolutely aced the other sections. So this means that interviewers should never write a candidate off and say, oh, well, this person bonded my section, therefore it doesn't, they don't matter. You, they should always assume that, you know, let's assume this person aced everything else and that we're going to really want to hire this person. And so that means that when you ask your question and the candidate can't answer it, it's really important that you navigate that in a way that doesn't leave them feeling hostile or negative or, or overly judged. You know, so some tips there that we find is ending, you know, if you're doing a section and the candidate's not doing well, rather, so, so, so candidates don't like just being like cut off and no, no feedback, right? They generally, so they generally like a little bit of closure. And so that's some, some forms of that are like ending five minutes early and just doing that little bit of just talk through with the candidates. You can, you can ask them to talk through, okay, you can say, I'm sorry, we're out of time, but you know, you know, we have a few minutes left. Can you talk through, you know, how you would, the steps you would take to finish this, this, this process, which you haven't finished during, during the session. And They'll talk, and you might learn something, right? They, you, you, there, there, there may be some signal there, and the fact that they can actually talk to you very well about how they would, you know, continue it. And regardless, that that will be sort of a better closure for that section than if you had just said, "Oh, sorry, we're done." You know, now it's over, and you'd walked out of the room. Other ideas there can be making small talk. So, you know, candidates, you know, ending having the section and then making just you know thirty seconds of small talk with the candidate about something which is not the evaluation, so that you end with some little personal relationship with the candidate. Um, and a thing we do a lot here is just talking about their tooling. 
So most engineers generally like talking about their, you know, how they configure their editor. So you interview sometimes with someone for 45 minutes and then you talk for five minutes about, you know, the shortcuts they've added to their editor. They generally like that. It's a way to decompress a bit. I think this, this part is actually tricky because in an on-site interview, you're often dealing with maybe five to eight people all together. You know, you deal with the reception, the recruiters involved somewhere, all the people that interview you. And my recollection of this process and, and people I've talked to is you always remember the worst part of it. So if the recruiter behaves badly for some reason, or if one of the people that interviews you seems like they're having a really bad day, or they're just like treating you with a sour manner, that is what you remember. And it seems pretty hard to craft a holistically positive experience, but you know it may sink the best candidates that end up coming through the door, the ones that you really want to hire, they're going to be remembering this this the lowest point of the interview, and that's what they're going to be anchored to. Yeah, and that, that just raises that just means that we have to raise our bar as as you know as companies and interviewers. So that that's a real human you know that's a, that's a <laughs> that's, that's how human memory works, and we have to know that and up the game sort of across the board. So it's not it's not okay for the receptionist to be rude to the candidate, right? It's not okay for people at lunch to be rude to the candidate. So like all those those de- in terms of closing rate, especially those details all matter. So trying to be like making sure that people come over and are talk to the candidate during lunch and are, are friendly and, and making sure that they, you know, shake their hand and wave goodbye as they walk away. And throughout the entire process, doing this as, you know, if you're doing it as a, their, their customers, because, you know, it's a customer experience and their experience matters. I, I think it's useful to have someone who's, you know, again, at a larger company, I think it's useful to have someone, maybe not full time, but at least when designing the process, totally focused on this. So someone thinking about, okay, how do we make this process accurate from a particular perspective? And then also someone with equal weight, thinking about how do we make this process as positive as possible for the candidate. The Casper mattress was designed by an in-house team of engineers that spent thousands of hours developing the mattress. And as a software engineer, you know what kind of development and dedication it takes to build a great product. The result is an exceptional product when you put in the amount of work and effort that went into the Casper mattress. You get something that you'd use and recommend to your friends. And you deserve an exceptional night's rest yourself so that you can continue building great software. Casper combines supportive memory foams for a sleep surface that's got just the right sink and just the right bounce. Plus... Its breathable design sleeps cool to help you regulate your temperature through the night. Stay cool, people. Stay cool. And buying a Casper mattress is completely risk-free. Casper offers free delivery and free returns with a 100-night home trial. If you don't love it, they'll pick it up and give you a full refund, like many of the software services that we have covered on Software Engineering Daily They are great with refunds. Casper understands the importance of truly sleeping on a mattress before you commit, especially considering that you're going to spend a third of your life on that mattress. Amazon and Google reviews consistently rank Casper as a favorite mattress, so try it out. Get a good night's rest and upvote it yourself today. As a special offer to Software Engineering Daily listeners, get $50 towards select mattress purchases by visiting casper.com slash sedaily and using the code sedaily at checkout. Terms and conditions do apply. You'll get the select mattress purchases if you go to casper.com slash sedaily and enter the code sedaily at checkout. Thank you, Casper. Does this stuff, all the stuff that we're talking about, does it apply to both startups and to big companies, and not just big tech companies, but maybe like companies that are turning into tech companies, like like banks, for example? You know, banks all need software engineers. Is this a uniform advice to constructing a hiring process? Yeah, I think it actually probably matters more for banks because the funny thing about companies that are turning into you know banks and, and even just you know big. CVS, like all of these companies are now trying to build real engineering teams. And they come from, you know, they're, they're larger, they're older, they have a culture in place. And that culture is often a little bit less friendly to candidates than engineering culture is. 
And I think if, you know, that, that can sometimes make it harder for them to hire because they, they have a process in place, they bring candidates in, and, you know, they, they use that same process for engineers. And then those, those engineers, you know, comparing that big company to, the, the, you know, the tech company down the street that was, you know, much nicer, will often choose the, the, the tech company. And so I think companies that are trying to hire engineers actually need to focus, you know, sort of even more on these things. Startups get a little bit of a pass in that startups are always a little bit of a, you know, a shit show. And that applies to hiring as well. And candidates do know that. So I don't want to really give, you know, I, th- I think startups should try to hold themselves to the same standard. But they are, you know, people who like stars, part of what they like is the like ad hoc, steve your pants, you know, build, the, build the, the tracks in front of the train aspect of it. And so they are given a little bit more of a pass on the, these issues. You and I last spoke about a year ago. How has the business at Triple Byte advanced over the last year? Yeah, a big thing is just we've, we've grown a lot. And so everything's larger scale. And my big focus has shifted from how do you design the optimal assessment process to really want to scaling it. And so that involves how do we keep this process standard across, you know, a growing team of, of you know, larger, larger numbers of individual interviewers um, doing the work. Has the interviewing process for Triple Byte changed over that period of time? For candidates who we're hiring internally? No, for candidates who are being hired through the platform. So I would say most of our big it has changed. It's changed a bit more incrementally than the year before, really for the same reason, right? Our, our priority has shifted from our goal is to maintain the same quality and then uh, deal with growth. And the things are always a bit of a trade-off. Um, so it's been a bit more, it's been kind of, okay, how do we scale? How do we keep, how do we, you know, quality assurance? How do we keep quality high? It's less on sort of how do we test out, you know, totally new t- classes of evaluation. And I think that's, that's probably that's just scaling. That's partly just the fact that we've I guess, market, you know, product market fit. You know, we've reached a point where the product is working well enough that there's less huge upside, right? We could probably get an additional, you know, 5% upside in predictive power by running some more large tests. Whereas, you know, a year ago, we were getting, you know, we were getting 5%, 10% boosts in individual tests. And how has the strategy for the company changed as you've decided that we have pretty good product market fit? Like, do you focus more on, on marketing or internal tooling? How does that shift? Ha- what, how has that shift affected your strategy? I mean, to be totally honest, right now I'm focused on not being broken due to the volume of <laughs> companies and candidates on the platform. That's great. That's a good place to be. And that, that's a pretty big headache, let's say. Yeah. It's good that you did 1,000 interviews yourself or however many interviews you've done at this point. That's, of course, not exactly scalable. And I know you've hired some people and you've, you've trained some people. What's been the training process for all those interviewers that you now have to hire to help you out through the Triple Y process? Yeah. So yeah, this, this has been a big thing I've been focused on. I think there are a few parts to it. The first is that they just have to be very strong in the content, right? So like, we are fundamentally assessing skills in these areas and people doing the assessing need to themselves be, you know, top percentile of engineers in their knowledge in these areas. Because when doing an interview, candidates will, candidates will ramble, right? I can't, I can't, so, so it's, it's, it's really interesting how looking at it's sort of, when put in the spotlight, how people go about revealing the knowledge. And so to tell if that, can, if that candidate's rambling is them going down an adjacent but correct you know, path versus them stonewalling and, and making things up, um, that really does require being pretty darn strong in all the areas. So the first is we, is we look for people who are, who are very strong. And I mentioned earlier that soft skills matter a lot. Um, so we end up rejecting actually about as many people who apply for soft skill reasons as we do for technical reasons. And just we want, you know, it's really important that they can guide the interview process, make it positive. The phrase we use internally is bedside manner. So the, the bedside manner of the interviewers matter, matters hugely. That's kind of the selection process. But then the, the, the biggest thing I focus on is this idea of consistency. So it, very interestingly, getting, you know, getting a group of people who are really smart, know their stuff, you know, strong soft skills, great communication, great bedside manner is actually not enough to have a good interview team. If you put those people in front of the candidates and have them ask the same questions, you will find that they will differ pretty significantly in how, they're, how they interpret the answers. Like there really is significant disagreement about sort of what even constitutes, you know, a great answer to the same interview question. And so most of our training goes into sort of standardizing that evaluation process. One of the reasons I was optimistic about Triple Byte from the earlier days was because I could tell that you were just going to do a bunch of interviews and get your hands dirty and really understand the process. And that's part of what I did when I started Software Engineering Daily. I just figured if I do tons and tons of interviews, then I can get good at interviewing people and make an entertaining product. One thing I didn't anticipate was the fact that doing all these interviews, at least in the earlier, maybe at about the 200 to 300 interview point, 
people started telling me that when I was just in an everyday conversation with them, they felt like they were being interviewed. Did you ever have that issue when you were, you know, when you were really going through all these interviews where people started to say, hey, Amon, can you just shut up for a second? Like you're, you're acting like you're interviewing me. I'm not sure. Anyone, no, no one ever told me that. I noticed it in my head. So I would notice when just <laughs> I would fall into like a line of reasoning or a line of discussion that I was like, suddenly it's this familiar, this familiar path. I don't think anyone ever, maybe, I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe, maybe my friends just, just didn't want to break it to me. I, I, no one ever gave me the feedback that I, that it sounded like I was, I was falling into interview mode. And it actually gets at one thing, which is that when conducting an interview, our goal, the goal of the team is to not seem like we're in interview mode. So we, we want to seem to the candidate like this is the first time we've asked these questions because that's the best. We want to seem like I'm your friend and I'm asking you this question as opposed to I'm an evaluator and I ask this question, you know, you know, four times a day. Is there anything else that engineers that are looking for a job right now or people that are constructing their hiring pipeline should take away from our conversation? Yeah, I think I mentioned this in my in the Y Combinator talk that I gave as well. But a thing that we do to help train the interviewers that I, I just really love is we have them interview each other. So we have, we conduct, you know, we, we set up pairs of people and we have them conduct technical interviews where they, they play the role of the, you know, the, the candidate or, or the interviewer and ask other questions. And this is an excellent way to highlight how divergent people are and what they think great answers are, is to get two smart people in the room and have them just conduct a sort of gloves off interview of each other. And uh, there's, there's a particular trick to it that we find works quite well, which is to, so again, so, so you, 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 you're, you know, you're in a room with one of your coworkers and, you know, you're going to play the candidate, they're going to play the interviewer, they're going to ask you questions. And what you do is you, you tell them up front that you're going to be role-playing a candidate and that you're going to intentionally give bad answers to some of the questions. And then they ask you questions, you intentionally give bad answers to some of them. Uh, but others, you try to answer really, you know, as, as best as you can. And what that does, then when the interview is done, you kind of debrief and your coworker sort of tells you about what they, you know, the mistakes they thought you made. And what that does is incentivize them to be brutally honest and to like look for flaws in your interview. Because, you know, the problem is that if you just, if you just go and interview your coworker, they're going to, you know, it's awkward to say, tell your coworker, oh, I think you were, you know, I think you, I think the way you designed this, this, that system was wrong and stupid, right? There's like this, this sort of decorum there that you wouldn't, you would never say that. But by setting it up where they know you're making mistakes, at that point, they look stupid, right? If you, if you say something which is incorrect and they don't point it out as a mistake, that's on them and they'll look a bit bad. And so what this does is create a situation where they're incentivized to actually point out all the flaws they saw in your interview. And so this is a way for you basically to get an honest assessment of what one of your smart coworker thinks of a lot of your ideas. And the key thing there is that they're, they're going to assess both the parts where you were trying to make mistakes, but they're also going to assess the parts where you were trying to give your best answer. And so it can, this is really eye-opening, by the way. You know, I've done this a bunch, and it's very it's humbling and eye-opening to get smart people to sort of like brutally critique your answers to questions. Okay. Well, Amon Bartram, thank you for coming back on Software Engineering Daily. It's always a pleasure to talk. Thank you. Data holds an incredible amount of value, but extracting value from data is difficult, especially for non-technical, non-analyst users. As software builders, you have a unique opportunity to unlock the value of data to users through your product or service. Jaspersoft offers embeddable reports, dashboards, and data visualizations that developers love. Give users intuitive access to data in the ideal place for them to take action, within your application. To check out Jaspersoft, go to softwareengineeringdaily.com slash jaspersoft and find out how easy it is to embed reporting and analytics into your application. Jaspersoft is great for admin dashboards or for helping your customers make data-driven decisions within your product, because it's not just your company that wants analytics, it's also your customers that want analytics. Jaspersoft is made by Tibco, the software company with two decades of experience in analytics and event processing. In a recent episode of Software Engineering Daily, we discussed the past, present, and future of TIBCO, as well as the development of Jaspersoft. In the meantime, check out Jaspersoft for yourself at softwareengineeringdaily.com slash Jaspersoft. Thanks to Jaspersoft for being a sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. Wow! 